The assumptions for our t-tests are going to be fairly similar between independent and dependent. So the first five assumptions that I've listed out here, I think in the flowcharts I kind of combine the variable um, and the sample stuff. So when you look at the numbering in our flowcharts, that might not match up exactly to this slide, but I like to list things out um, so you make sure you have a checklist on what you need. Random sampling and a normal distribution with no significant outliers. This specifically applies to our dependent variable in this case. Um, but those two are always going to be major assumptions that we have to meet for any statistical test just because of our statistical inference concept where we're trying to make sure that our sample is representative of our population. Um, again, kind of flowing through our decision tree or our study design, we have one dependent variable that's represented by ratio or interval data. And our independent variable, we have one with two levels or two categories that we are saying is nominal data. Now the types of samples we know can be between or within subjects. And based on if you have between or within subjects, that will determine if you have um, a specific or a more specific assumption attached to the test. So when we have between subject independent variables and we're running an independent t-test, we have to check for homogeneity of variance using Levine's test. If we have a within subject independent variable and we've decided we're going to use a paired samples t-test, that means we need to look at normality and determine that we have no significant outliers of difference scores. And we'll go through how you would be able to analyze this in SPSS a little bit, um, I think like two or three slides from now. But these two um, orange boxes are going to be specific to the type of test you've determined. So when I ask you guys like, oh, what are the assumptions for an independent um, t-test, you would have these first four plus the fact that your independent variable is a between subject variable plus homogeneity of variance. If you had a paired samples t-test and it asked you to list the assumptions, it would be these first four, <laughs> a within subject independent variable, and then you have to have normality and no significant outliers of the different scores. Okay, so just make sure you're not like listing everything every single time, but you're taking into account like which test am I running, which you should be able to get between assumptions one through five and then that last special assumption should be based on if you've decided if you're running an independent versus a paired samples t-test. For homogeneity of variance, again it's for independent t-tests only. This will also come back when we talk about independent or one sample ANOVAs. So um, it, it'll be a repeated concept if you don't get it this week Hopefully it'll start to make sense as we introduce it in the ANOVA lectures. Um, but we test it with Levine's test, which is run in the output for the independent t-test. So when we set up the test, it's automatically included in the output. And we do get a statistic for Levine's test that is then evaluated with a p-value. So any time that we have a p-value, we know we have a null hypothesis that's been tested. So the null for Levine's test is that the variance of each sample is the same. In other words, the variance of sample A is equal to the variance of sample B. Now I do want to make sure you guys understand that the null hypothesis for homogeneity of variance is the null hypothesis for the assumption. And based on the evaluation of P for this assumption, that will tell us if we've met the assumption or if we violated the assumption. Right? So the null for, the, for this test is not the same as the null hypothesis for the main effect of t-tests, which is actually looking at if we have differences between two means or not. Okay, so don't get that confused. Um, and this will start to be a concept that is slowly introduced um, in ANOVAs as well. And I know students oftentimes are like, oh, let me look at the p-value for homogeneity of variance, and I've looked at the rest of the like the t-test so I can determine if we have significant differences or not. Mm -mm. Um, and I think for t-tests it's particularly confusing 
because the p-value for homogeneity of variance is in the same table as the p-value for the t-test. So we'll go through examples of what that looks like in the output, but I just want to make sure you guys have it clarified. The, the null hypothesis for homogeneity of variance is not the same thing and it's not evaluating the same effect as the null hypothesis for the t-test. Um, when we look at the p-values though, we interpret them exactly the same as we would for any p-value. So if p is greater than 0.05, again, it, we're assuming 0.05 for Levine's test because the setup of our SPSS uh, test is going to be with an alpha or uh, alpha of 0.05 or level of confidence of 95%, that's our default. So if p is greater than 0.05, we know we accept the null hypothesis. That's nothing new. Um, but interpretation-wise, this would mean we have met our assumption, right? Because if we are accepting the null, then we're saying that the variance of sample A and sample B are equal to each other, which is what we want. If we get a p-value less than 0.05, we typically say, oh, reject the null hypothesis. But that, in this case, would mean that our assumption has been violated or that the variance of sample A and sample B are not equal to each other, right? Remember our... Um, reject and accept are mutually exclusive to each other. So in SPSS, what this looks like, um, in your output, you'll get this table that's labeled as independent samples test. And then you'll see a section of the table says Levine's test for equality of variances. And then the rest of the table is the t-test for equality of means. Um, so when you're checking your assumption, you have to check your assumptions first. Right? And you're going to draw your attention to the SIG column, which is going to be the p-value for Levine's test. Um, and I, there's a little note in here to use the significance level to determine if the variances are equal in the population. So in this case, 0.174 is in fact greater than 0.05. So if we come back to our p-value interpretations, this would indicate that our assumption is met and that we have equal variances between the groups that we are examining. In the table, you'll see one row of the table is where we have equal variances assumed. The other row is where we have uh, equal variances as not assumed. So top row is when we have met our homogeneity of variance assumption. The bottom row is when we have violated the um, assumption. So once you figure out if you've uh, met or violated your assumption, that ends up telling you which row to read to obtain the p-value for your t-test. Okay, so this is a very important step. You make sure you do this first. Again, once you figure out if you have violated or met your assumption, that tells you which p-value to accept for the main effect of the t-test. When we have a within-subject sample, um, or within subject uh, independent variable where we've measured people twice. We have the additional um, assumption of checking normality and making sure we have no significant outliers of different scores. So to do this, I've listed the, the steps in SPSS. Um, up in the kind of top area where we usually go to like analyze or make graphs, we're going to choose the tab that says transform. And then we're going to use um, the compute variable uh, test or function. That will bring up a dialog box that looks like this. In this particular example um, I got from uh, the Laird Statistics uh, website, they were looking at the difference between um, a carb solution or carbohydrate solution versus a carbohydrate plus protein solution. Um, so in this case, they're kind of looking at what is the added effect of having additional protein. So um, the general rule of thumb is that we're going to create a target variable that we're just going to say is difference. So when you're doing this, just literally type difference, and that will be the name of the variable that goes back into your data view. The numeric expression is going to usually be the experimental group minus the control group. Okay, so whatever those variables are for you in here, you kind of just insert them in the order of experimental group minus control group. From there, you can press OK, 
and that will end up adding this new difference variable to your output. And then from there, we can just test for normality and outliers using the explore analysis that we talked about at the beginning of the semester. So um, we could do a Shapiro Wilkes test. We could look at um, uh, like our skewness and kurtosis values, right? Remember in the output, it'll give you a sample skewness and a sample kurtosis as well as a standard error of skewness and kurtosis and you have to divide um, those values, okay? So very, very similar to everything that we've done um, previous to exam one. Um, again, we'll go through some examples of this in the activity this week, so you'll have a fair representation of how to do this uh, step by step. Alright, so those, those kind of wrap up the added assumptions that we haven't discussed in this class up to this point. The other thing I wanted to bring back is we had previously talked about um, Cohen's D effect sizes when we looked at sample size and power analyses. And we're actually going to calculate the effect sizes for um, t-tests and for ANOVAs as well. Um, but really what we're, we're looking at within effect size is we're saying how large is the difference in the grand scheme of the unit we've measured, right? So we can, we can understand that, oh, if we get a p-value less than 0.05, we have a significant difference, right? But looking closer into that mean difference, is it, like, looking at an effect size will tell you if that's a meaningful difference or not, right? Because we could have a difference of 0.02 that's flagged as significant, but for a different unit of measurement, um, a, a difference of 10 might be significant. Those are two very different values, right? But both might be labeled as significant, so investigating effect sizes are going to tell us how meaningful that small difference or that large difference actually is. And we can do this by looking at our descriptive statistics, which will be in the group statistics um, table in your output. So um, this is just the example that uh, the Laird Statistics website had, but in terms of identifying what the different variables are in our equations, that's why I use this table because it's a little bit easier to follow step by step. So Cohen's D, um, and I don't want you guys to get this confused with um, uh, our assumptions for regressions. So if it helps you to use a different variable, that's okay. If you want to put Cohen's D, that's fine. Um, this is just how it's usually referred to. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave that there. Um, but when we're looking at Cohen's D, which is our effect size, we're looking at the mean difference divided by a pooled standard deviation. When we look at the mean difference, we want to make sure we're taking the absolute value of the difference. Um, so that way we're just looking at what's the absolute difference between the means and not having any influence of uh, negative values in our uh, final equation. That'll be the divided by the pooled standard deviation, which we calculate by looking at S1, which is our standard deviation of our of one group, okay, multiplied by the sample size of that group minus one. So this is kind of accounting for degrees of freedom um, in, in one subset of our equation. Then we do the same thing for um, our second sample. So in this case, it would be standard deviation of our second sample squared um, times the sample size minus one of that same group. And then we divide this by the total sample size, so both samples added together, minus two. Again, this will be um, another way that we account for degrees of freedom in our calculation. We take the square root of that, and that ends up being our pooled standard deviation. So if we use the numbers from this table, we should get something that kind of looks like this, and we end up with an effect size of 0.346. Now, generally speaking, um, we kind of gauge our 
effect sizes off of these values here. These are the same values I've presented you guys with, uh, oh, I think it was module three, okay? So 0.2, or an effect size of 0.2 is considered small, um, 0.5 is considered medium, and 0.8 is considered large. In this case, 0.3 I would say is a little bit closer to 0.2, so I would say we have a small effect size or a relatively small effect size for this particular example. If we have paired samples t-tests, um, we do get a different output. So when you plug in your variables, just make sure you're doing the experimental group first and then the control group, that way it calculates it nicely. Um, if all else fails and you end up getting a negative mean difference, you can always just say, I want the absolute difference of the mean difference um, to make sure, again, that negatives aren't going to be influencing your Cohen's D uh, value. From there, you're going to divide by the standard deviation in the paired differences table. So that's kind of like already calculated for you. And then if we use the numbers that are provided in this example, we end up with an effect size of 1.42, which is larger than 0.8. So that would indicate we have a relatively large effect size between the two groups that were investigated in this particular research question. Right. That concludes kind of the fundamental concepts that surround t-tests. The next video will go through how to set up the test in SPSS as well as how you would interpret different components of your output.